Okay, so as I was saying, we are starting with Bayesian parameter estimation today. And there's two uh, mindsets with respect to statistics. There are frequentists and Bayesian um, people. And so frequentists are those that tend to feel that they don't know anything and they derive stuff from scratch. And that is what they use in order to do statistics, whether it's descriptive and or inferential statistics. Whereas Bayesians, believe that we always have some prior knowledge, even if that knowledge is that we don't know anything. And so they derive uh, methods based on what we know. And again, what we, may, what we know may, may be nothing. And I'll, I'll, give, uh, I'll clarify that a little bit more in a moment. And so, Today, you're going to be exposed to the Bayesian approach to parameter estimation. And you've seen conditional probability before. This has just a little bit more notation in it, but you could view the x1 through xn data as your b part. And so you've got the probability of a given b here. And on top, it's a and b, but that is with the reverse conditional probability. What I mean by that is, and let me actually make this note here. And so with the Bayesian approach, the probability that A given B by conditional probability definition is PA and B over PB. But you could rewrite that numerator as PB given A, so you flip the conditional times PA over PB. And that essentially is what's been done here. Isn't that like really similar to like Bayes theorem? It is, but it's, it's gonna change a little bit. So <clears throat> what we're interested in is estimating the unknown parameter, which is theta. This term on the bottom, notice has nothing to do with theta. That is just a constant. We don't know what its value is, but whatever it is, it's just shifting this probability either up or down. That's all the effect it has. And so what is typically done is that is usually dropped or ignored, which brings us here with a new symbol. I know it looks like alpha, but this is the proportionality symbol. So this means P of theta given the data is proportional to what's on the right side. And notice what's on the right side is the numerator of the line above. And so it's really important to understand what has happened and why. Remember, the focus is on estimating the unknown parameter, which is theta in general, and that the denominator for your basic conditional probability definition is a constant with respect to theta. Theta has no place there. And so you could temporarily ignore that and really just focus on everything else. Now for terminology. The left side, the probability of theta given your data is called the posterior distribution. <clears throat> the probability of your data given theta is called your likelihood. And the probability of theta is referred to as your prior distribution. The prior, this is representative or represents what we know. So you could think of that as prior or pre-existing knowledge. That is your prior distribution. <clears throat> now, what bugged me when I first learned about Bayesian parameter estimation or just Bayesian inference in general is that the prior distribution is something that you just make up. 
Um, you typically choose it from known distributions, but it's not often given in a problem. It's in practice, it is something that you reason through what is the appropriate distribution. For example, if I were doing, <clears throat> so just some quick examples, if I were doing an inference with respect to salary and I had a parameter that correspond to salary, I know that salaries typically are in the relatively low end and that there's very few people in a company that earn a whole lot. And so it tends to be a right skewed distribution. And I know that right skewed can be represented by a chi squared or maybe an F distribution. And so I would say, okay, I am going to choose one of these types of distributions to correspond to the prior distribution for this concept. As another example, so this, this one went with salaries. I might have another one with respect to, let's say, grades. And in general, it's pretty common for students to think of grades as maybe looking something like this. where it's relatively symmetric. There's a whole lot of people in the middle in the BC range. There's very few <laughs> that do awesome. And there's very few, hopefully, that really bomb that exam. And so here you may use, you might use a normal distribution. Or if you know that the, the values are confined, like grades are, you know, often grades are between zero and 100 you might use a beta distribution because normal has an infinite support, whereas beta is between zero and one. But you could transform that to be between zero and 100. So beta, it is a pretty neat distribution to, uh, to use. Or what you guys will see is more common is I might have a scenario such as, and I'll just use my knowledge, I don't really know anything about stocks. And so I might have a parameter that corresponds to the distribution of stock price. And I will acknowledge that I don't have any prior or pre-existing knowledge. And I am going to assume a distribution like this, which is uniform. So uniform is typically what is used when you don't know anything. And so it's... Um, it's good to keep that in mind because you may very well make use of it. <clears throat> so that's, that to me is the most awkward part about Bayesian inference in general, is that the prior distribution may or may not be given to you. I'll more likely give or hint at it. But in practice, it's just something that based on your understanding of that context, you would choose an appropriate distribution that likely fits or represents that idea. So that's a, probably a slightly long-winded background for you, but, but some information. And that's, that's how you get your prior. The likelihood you experienced from, um, from the maximum likelihood estimation. Sydney, I don't know what that means. Thanks. It was just a, a meme of a, oh. a guy pointing at a graph of stocks. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because <laughs> if it was a question, I, I did not know how to answer it. Okay, so what your goal is, is to get the, pri the posterior distribution. So the likelihood you get from your PDF or PMF the prior you get either because it's told or you reason through what do you know and what does the shape of that distribution look like and thus this is the appropriate distribution for it. And then according to what I have mostly in yellow there, you would multiply the likelihood by the prior in order to approximately, because remember you have a proportionality 
notation there, approximately represent your posterior distribution. All right, so there's one last thing before we get to a problem, and that is there are some special priors that when you use those, they are going to result in a posterior distribution of the same type. So what I mean by that is that, <clears throat> for example, if you look at the table, if you have a binomial distribution for your likelihood and you use a beta prior, the posterior distribution will be a beta distribution. If you have a Poisson dis distribution for your likelihood and a gamma prior, your posterior will be a gamma distribution and so on. So, <clears throat> so that's really advantageous if it makes sense it's really advantageous to choose conjugate priors it's not required but it's just clean you know the work comes out really neat all right so that's just a little terminology and background for you but let's actually apply it i'm going to skip over problem one for a moment i'm going to start with problem two here Problem two says, let x1 through xn be a random sample from a gamma one comma theta distribution, and let h of theta be proportional to one over theta. So this corresponds to your prior distribution. Right, that's your prior, and <clears throat> this will relate to our likelihood. <clears throat> we want to find the posterior distribution. All right, so let's work through this and start putting pieces together. We have h of theta. We know that f of x given theta, so this is <clears throat> your distribution usually with the beta or the, uh, the Bayesian perspective you write as conditional. So it's f of x given this parameter value is going to be, and since alpha is one, this is exponential. So you have one over theta e to the negative x over theta. <clears throat> but we got experience with the MLE approach that the likelihood which in this case is written as a probability of x1 through xn given theta. This is the product of your f of x given theta functions where i is one to n. <clears throat> and so this is going to be one over theta to the n e to the negative sum of your data you know, that looks like an E, but it's sum of the data over theta, <clears throat> which is theta to the negative n, E to the negative n x bar over theta. So other than notation, we've, we've been through this process before of finding the likelihood. What's new now is we want to multiply this likelihood by the prior. So, our posterior distribution, the probability of theta given x1 through xn, we know will be proportional to <coughs> theta to the negative n, e to the negative n x bar over theta, that's the posterior, the likelihood function, times the prior, which is one over theta, but I'm gonna write that as a theta to the negative one. And so when you multiply, we have theta to the negative n minus one, e to the negative n x bar over theta.
So this is essentially our posterior distribution. Remember, it's proportional, which means there's some constant that's missing, <clears throat> but this is the general foundation of it. Now, it doesn't look close enough to a known distribution, but it's at this point where you want to either try to see if it is or if you could make it into a known distribution. And that's where part B comes into play for this particular problem. So part B recognizes that, <clears throat> that this is one over theta to the n plus one e to the negative one over theta over one over n x bar. <clears throat> I know it feels really awkward to do this, but I put it in this form because it almost looks like a gamma distribution. Gamma is x to the alpha minus one, e to the negative x over beta over theta. And so we almost have that, but in our variable here is theta, but it looks like one over theta, which is why in part b, I do a change of variables where I choose z. It doesn't have to do with the z-score, I just chose z, but you could use w. z is one over theta. So this way I get rid of that that ratio, that fraction form. So we're gonna apply a change of variables in part B. And I know that theta is always positive because that is given right here, which indicates that this Z equals one over theta is going to be monotonic, which means we could use the shortcut approach to the transformation. So, theta is 1 over z, which means that theta prime is negative 1 over z squared. And so our shortcut <coughs> is going to end up giving us z is 1 over theta to the n plus 1 e to the negative z over 1 over n x bar times the absolute value of theta prime, which is 1 over z squared. And when you simplify, we get z to the n minus 1 e to the negative z over one over n x bar. And this looks more like a gamma distribution. So here we have the probability of, and this is our parameter, which is z now, given our data, I'm squeezing in the proportionality symbol there. <clears throat> but this is that distribution. So now we need to figure out, okay, well, what specific gamma distribution is this? So I could see that Z, given our data, is distributed gamma. where alpha is n because this is typically alpha minus one, so alpha corresponds to n here. And this would be our theta, one over n x bar. And that would be our posterior distribution. Now this is the posterior distribution of z given the data, which at least we were able to, to classify it as a known distribution, which is good. That's, that's usually the goal that you want, is to somehow recognize it or put it into a form of a known distribution. 
In part C, we finally want to get to parameter estimation. And so a good estimate for a parameter would be the mean of the distribution that it comes from. So in part C, the expected value of Z, given the data that we have, since this is a gamma distribution, that's going to be alpha times theta. <coughs> And our alpha in this case is n, our theta is 1 over n x bar, which means we have 1 over x bar. And that's great, but z wasn't our original parameter. Theta was. And so this implies that the expected value of theta, given our data, is going to be the reciprocal of that. Why? How do I know it's, it's the reciprocal? Because theta equals one over z. Yes. Yes, perfect. So I use this relationship back in b, because z is one over theta, so theta is one over z. And so if the expected value for z, given the data, is one over x bar, then it makes sense that the expected or average value corresponding to theta would be the reciprocal of that. And so that, for this problem, is how we got to an estimate for the value of theta. And so what's neat about this is, like the previous two methods, method of moments and MLE, is we're, est we're coming up with a value based on the data. We don't have explicit data here, but we know that if we did, you would take the average and that would be your, your actual value or an estimate for the value. So this is just the first problem. It's just a taste of it. Um, <clears throat> but let's, let's do a few more so that you, you get more of a feel for it. And let's look at three. So problem three says consider a random variable x that is binomial distributed n comma p. We want to determine the posterior distribution if P has a, an uninformative prior. So uninformative is another way of saying that it's, it's, a, it's just a uniform distribution. So we don't know anything, which is why it's, it's not very helpful. And so a uniform distribution here, because this is P, where P is some probability, it makes sense to have it uniform over 0 to 1, because remember, probabilities are somewhere equal to or between zero and one. So that is going to be our prior distribution. So what do we know? We know that the, oh, that the probability of P, so the prior distribution, is one over one minus zero, because this is the uniform, which is just one. And we know that X, given n and p is binomial, which is n choose x, p to the x, one minus p to the n minus x. <clears throat> so if we wanted to pretend that we had n observations, so we had x1, x2, x3, up through xn, we could go through and get the likelihood. So this is the probability of some data given these two parameters equals the product of n choose xi P to the sum of the x's, which is n x bar, times 1 minus p to the sum of n minus x, which is going to be n squared minus n x bar. 
<clears throat> so I know I'm doing a lot of this in my head, but if you need to write it out more to, uh, to see the steps, feel free to do that. <clears throat> and that's our likelihood. Our prior is on the first line. And so when you multiply those two, and I'm going to drop this term because it has nothing to do with P. Right? And so P is the unknown. N would be the amount of data that we have. So we would actually have a value for N. P is really what I want to estimate here. So drop because there's no P. And what, we le what we're left with is that the posterior distribution, the probability of P, given our data, I didn't put N in there because it's the subscript of X, and so I know there's N values, <laughs> is proportional to P N X bar times one minus P N squared minus N X bar. So now I need to figure out what is this distribution? I mean, this is the posterior, but in part B, it says, well, it should have a beta distribution. And so this is our answer for A. But now we want to figure out, well, how can we put it into a beta form? <clears throat> so let's go back and look at our table. And I want to find where I might put that. Here we go. Again, this is on Lalima. And so a beta distribution, note, has the form x to alpha minus one, one minus x to beta minus one. Here, x is <clears throat> the unknown, that's our variable, but for us, p is our x. And so we need a something minus one in both powers. That's the form, something minus one. I'm looking at the beta distribution, which is that top row. Everything before the gamma of alpha plus beta over gamma alpha, gamma beta, those are constants. So that's kind of thrown away in the proportionality symbol. So let's go back and put it into an alpha minus one power and a beta, uh, a beta minus one power. <clears throat> and I'm going to do that with the following. I could see that the probability of P given our data is proportional to, and I'm going to write p to the n x bar plus 1 minus 1. So I essentially added 0. I'm going to do the same trick with the 1 minus p part. And so this form now looks like the beta distribution, where I can say that P, given some data, looks to be distributed beta, where alpha is n x bar plus 1, and our beta, the beta parameter, not beta distribution, is n squared minus n x bar plus one. And so here we figured out 
how it looks like beta and what the values or what how we would compute alpha and beta for this conditional distribution. <clears throat> so this one doesn't ask for it, but let's go ahead and use it in order to estimate a value for p, or at least a formula that we would use if faced with beta to get a value for p. And so again, we now know the posterior distribution, so the mean is a good estimate for the parameter that that is posterior distribution of. The mean for beta, I think I remember it, but just to be sure, I'll, I'll look it up. So the mean is alpha over alpha plus beta. I'm <clears throat> looking in the top row under the E of X column, alpha over alpha plus beta. So we're gonna make use of that. And so if we had to estimate an estimate for P, would be alpha, which is n x bar plus one over alpha plus beta. And I see n x bars cancel out. And this simplifies a little bit to n x bar plus one over n squared plus two. So again, if we had n values, whether it's 10, 20, 5, you could get the average, you know, the sample size, you would plug those two concepts in here, and that would give you a value as an estimate for p. If you wanted a measure of the uncertainty, you could get the variance. And so being a beta distribution, and I won't go through it, but I'll just talk you through it. Being a beta distribution, we got an estimate as the mean, and then a measure of the variability would be the variance, which is that uglier formula, alpha beta over alpha plus beta plus one times alpha plus beta squared. And so you would use that in order to get the variance, and then you could even get a confidence interval like we did last class. So, so if you wanted to ha have an idea of how accurate or variable that estimator is, you would look at the variance. All right, haven't done two problems so far, and there's a few more which we will get through, but I want to check um, the chat, or again, you could speak up if you have questions or before, uh, before seeing some more. Um, when we have the uh, distribution as beta and we had proportionality from before, uh, does that affect the estimate, the constant um, from the part A? Or would it, would it still just be the proportional exp expression? So it, it does affect it, but it's going to be minimal. Okay. Uh, there's, if you wanted to be exact, you would keep that in there and you would actually simulate a distribution, but it's close enough, assuming that that constant will be hidden in the new constants of alpha or gamma of alpha plus beta over gamma alpha gamma beta, which is what you have as the coefficient of the beta distribution. And so you could okay. assume that that product of n choose xi I, I think that's what you're referring to, that that mm -hmm. value is hidden within the, uh, the new constant of the beta distribution. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else with questions? No for number 2A. Um, so on the second line, you're finding, you're finding like the opposite, right? Data given all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And according to the top, 
like it, it says you have to you have to divide all that by px1 to like xn not if you look at the row below that underlined in yellow that denominator was ignored which is why the equal sign this equal sign became a proportionality sign because we dropped the probability of the data. Do you always drop the denominator? Yes, and so it simplifies the, the work and it makes it easier to detect what distribution that posterior distribution looks like it comes from. And so we dropped okay. it in problem two. Um, and we, so it was already dropped for us in, uh, in problem in problem two, because the prior was given as being proportional to one over theta, not actually equal to. And then problem three, we clearly dropped what I had underlined in red in the, uh, the first row, that product of the combinations. Oh. Wait, is that? You dropped it for the same reason? Essentially, because it's a term that has nothing to do with the parameter. There's no P in there. So it's, it's just some constant that is increasing or decreasing everything else. So do you drop the denominator because it's a constant? It's a constant with respect to your parameter. So as far as p or theta go, the probability of x1, give, you know, x1, x2, x3 through xn has nothing to do with the parameter. Okay. But again, it's just two problems so far. There's a few more that I wanted to give you a chance to ask clarifying questions at this point. So let's take a look at the next one. Number four here. And it says define y to be the sum of x1 through xn where the x's are iid Poisson theta. Does anyone remember what iid stands for? Yeah, independent and identically distributed. Yes, thank you Kiko. And it tells us to choose a gamma alpha beta prior. So the data are Poisson and we want a gamma prior. And again, the reason is because according to this table, you could see that if Poisson is gonna give you your likelihood, a conjugate prior for Poisson is gamma. I'm looking in the same, the same row. So that's why, that's why gamma was chosen in, in problem four. All right, so let's start putting information together. <laughs> the probability of x given theta is, and this is e to the negative theta, theta to the x over x factorial. This is just the Poisson PMF but being that we have n values, the likelihood is going to be e to the negative sum of thetas, which is negative n theta, because theta is constant. So you're adding theta over and over and over again, n times. And then you have theta to the sum of x's, which is n x bar, over the product of x i factorials. 
<clears throat> so I see going forward that this denominator doesn't have theta in it. And so I could drop that. when I actually put together my posterior distribution. Next, I need the gamma distribution. And so this is the prior distribution. Remember prior is the distribution for the parameter. And so this is one place where, where, where you guys might, might make a mistake. This is the distribution or the probability of theta. So theta has a gamma distribution. And <clears throat> so the gamma distribution, and I'm going to write it out. This is one over gamma of alpha, theta to the alpha, theta to the alpha minus one, e to the negative theta over beta. All right, so wherever you would have had an x because you're used to distributions being a function of x, now you're put, putting in theta. And just as I did with the likelihood, I recognize that this term has nothing to do with theta, so I'm going to drop this also. When I go ahead and I put together my posterior distribution, so the probability of theta given my data is proportional to, and now I'm going to multiply the two functions I got on the, the top two lines without what I circled in red. So I see my theta terms when I multiply those together, I get theta n x bar plus alpha minus one, and my exponential terms, when I multiply those together, I have e to the negative n theta minus theta over beta. Now I'm gonna play with the exponential part. I'm gonna do that over here. And so I have negative n theta minus theta over beta. And if I get a common denominator of beta and put the, the negative sign, the minus sign out front, I have n theta beta plus theta. And if I factor out that theta, I have negative theta n beta plus one over beta, which I'm going to rewrite as negative theta divided by the reciprocal. Now, why did I do that? Because that's often part of the issue, is as I was working through, I realized, well, I have, this is a function of theta, so I have theta to a power minus one and e to a negative power. So it almost looks like a gamma distribution, but I need, if this is a gamma distribution for theta, I need the exponential to be negative theta over something. So I have to get it into the appropriate form. That's what my thought process was. And so now going back to the line on the left side, I have theta to the n x bar plus alpha minus one e to the negative theta divided by beta over n beta plus one. And now this looks like a gamma distribution. In particular, I can see that theta given x1 through 
Xn looks to be distributed gamma where <clears throat> the first parameter is n x bar plus alpha and the second parameter is beta over n beta plus one. And that would be our answer. If we wanted to go ahead and again estimate theta, what would you guys do? Use the expected value. The expected value for a gamma distribution, which is, and I, I miss seeing who that was. Kiko, is that your voice? Uh, yep. All right, Kiko. Uh, uh, alpha, alpha times theta. Yes. So the expected value of the conditional distribution is given by alpha times theta. So the first term times the second term. And so we've got beta times n x bar plus alpha divided by n beta plus one. And this would give you your estimate if you had data. The, the prior distribution would be known. So that alpha and beta term would actually have values. You can have hierarchical estimation, but I'm not going to teach you that. And so the only thing that for you guys wouldn't be known would be a parameter with respect to the likelihood. I'm not going to get more complicated than that. So beta, alpha would be known, n and x bar would come from your actual data, and you would be able to calculate this in order to get an estimate for theta, given your data. So it's kind of cool, or at least I think it's cool. Despite that, I'm not a basis, a basis. I'm, a, I'm a frequentist, but, but it is kind of neat with, uh, with how the reasoning works. There, no, for, yeah? I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. What's your question? For this problem, like, okay, so you know how it says choose a gamma prior? Mm -hmm. Wasn't there like two gamma priors and then you kind of, oh no, there's three. Um, yeah. You know, for the gamma priors, you have to look at like the chart for that because isn't there like the, um, are you talking to get stuff? This chart? Yeah. No, so we have um I forgot. We were X is Poisson. And so I am just looking at this rose here. So it's just a single gamma. Oh, wait, okay. Um, am I am I not understanding your question? Oh, it's a sports, so it told you it was gamma based on okay. Yeah, in, and in then, practice, in reality, you wouldn't know of the gamma prior. You would know, oh, this distribution, I believe a Poisson distribution fits this data set. <clears throat> but you want to use a Bayesian approach. And if you're familiar with the idea of conjugate priors, you would choose a gamma prior. So you could always look up conjugate distributions you know, on Google and you'd see, oh, for a Poisson distribution, I would want a gamma prior. <clears throat> for problem four, I didn't make you go through that effort. I just told you use a gamma prior. But in reality, <clears throat> you, uh, you would need that reasoning in order to know to use a gamma prior. You have to do P of um, theta is equal to, and then you have the gamma stuff. 
What's the question? Um, you know how um, can you explain what you did for the second and third line again? So the second line is just the gamma distribution. So I I I just happen to know it, but I went here. Gamma is the third line. And so I just rewrote this functional form because that is the gamma distribution. But this is a gamma prior. And the prior distribution the prior distribution is a function of the parameter. I'm emphasizing that because that's, that's where students may make a mistake is you might write it as a function of x, but it's actually a function of your parameter, whether it's theta, p, alpha, beta, whatever, whatever the unknown parameter is, it's a function of that. And so in our case, I kept that in mind and I realized wherever there's an x, I'm gonna replace that with a theta. And so that's what I did, was I rewrote this function, and I did it I did it with theta for x, and this is a gamma distribution where the parameters are alpha and beta. So alpha is what you're used to. We've got um, something to the alpha minus one, but theta, or the original theta in the distribution on the table, is now beta. So I've got e to the negative something over beta. I have one over gamma of alpha, and then beta to the alpha. So all the second line is, is just writing the gamma distribution using the two parameters that it's stated, which is gamma of alpha beta, and changing x to theta because this is a prior distribution. So that means it is representing knowledge about the parameter, not about your data. Is that clear for line two? Um, can you read that last part? The last part I said was that this is a function of your parameter theta, and I know that because we are told that this is the prior distribution. And the prior distribution is always a function of your parameter. Okay. So that was line two. Line three is just enacting this top relationship here. So I want the posterior, which means I need to multiply the likelihood by the prior. And so I took the likelihood, which is the first line. So that is this part here. I dropped the bottom because there's no theta in there. And I multiplied that by the prior, which is this part here. I dropped what circled in red, again, because there's no parameter there, no theta, which is what we care about. That's what we're trying to estimate. And I multiplied those two together to get to the third line. Sydney, did you hear me? Yeah, you multiply them to get to the third line. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any questions on the, the chat board. Does, does anyone have any other questions before we continue? Okay, so I wanna give you guys a chance to, to try a little bit on your own. So take a look at number five here. It says, 
pretend that you have a sample of n observations, x1 through xn, that come from a uniform theta minus 1 to theta plus 1 distribution. Determine the Bayesian estimate for theta using a chi-square r degrees of freedom prior. So at this point, I just want you to do two things. I want you to determine your likelihood and state your prior distribution. So just write those two parts out. And if you happen to feel confident that you got those right, feel free to, to continue past that step. But just try to state your likelihood and then also state your prior. I'm gonna pause the video to give you a minute or so to try to tackle that task. All right, so about a quarter of the class were able to make progress and, and get the answer, or at least the likelihood portion. So let's go through there. And well, can you, oh, sorry. What's your question? Um, for like this problem, and like maybe some of the others, can you like label like which is which, like when you get the likelihood and stuff? Because I know we kind of did that for some previous problems, but I didn't know like what exactly was the likelihood and you kind of just went through the steps for like i don't know just be a little helpful if like you have like labels like this is the likelihood or something i don't know if you know what i mean i do um this is there or two to the negative n and so that's your likelihood Is it one half? Mm -hmm. and, yep, because one over theta plus one minus theta minus one will simplify to one half. One over, one over B minus A. Yeah, I'm labeling it, but it, it, it just follows the pattern at the top of the, uh, this lesson. And so the prior, we were told, is a chi-square distribution. And so remember, chi-square is gamma, where alpha is r over 2. And theta is 2, so this is 1 over gamma r over 2, 2 to the r over 2, theta to the r over 2 minus 1, e to the negative theta over 2. So this is your chi-square distribution, but instead of using x, I use theta because Remember, this is a prior distribution, so it has to be a function of the unknown parameter. Is the x squared or uh, refer to chi squared? Yeah, that's that's the notation for chi square. It looks like an x, but it's it's the Greek symbol chi. Is that the pri that's a prior, right? This part, yeah. All 
And how would you know that, Sydney? Well, it says the chi-square prior. So that's one way. And then the other is that it is the distribution of only the unknown parameter. So notice that this term doesn't have a theta in it, nor does this. The likelihood it doesn't have theta in it either, which is helpful because when you go to get your posterior, the probability of theta given some data That is just proportional to theta to the r over 2 minus 1 e to the negative theta over 2. Which looks like what distribution? Exponential? Not quite exponential. Exponential would be if your alpha value was one. Gamma. Okay. Or chi squared. Yes. So it's it is gamma, r over two comma two, but that happens to be chi square r degrees of freedom. So theta given some data. is gamma r over two comma two, which is, and you don't need to write both of these, but I'm, I'm just writing it out, which is chi-square r degrees of freedom. And our goal was to come up with a Bayesian estimate <clears throat> And so if we want to estimate, use the mean of this distribution, so the expected value of theta given your data. For a chi-square random variable, and you saw this class or two ago, I think it might have been the last one, that is just the degrees of freedom, just R. So whatever your prior is, because again, R would be known, that is what's going to be used in S as an estimate. Notice that has nothing to do with your data, which is fine because we used, um, the likelihood was uninformative. It's just a uniform distribution, so all values are equally likely. It's not the prior distribution, but essentially everything is equally likely according to the data. And so what happens to simplify in this case is that the best parameter estimate is, the, is coming from the degrees of freedom of the prior distribution for this example. It's kind of neat that it simplifies that way. So this was a uniform likelihood with a chi-square prior. And notice that that wasn't listed as a conjugate prior. It happens to work out that the posterior is the same type of distribution as the prior, but, but for uniform, usually something called a Pareto distribution is, is what's used. Um, we didn't do it that way, but, but it's fine. And if I did have a problem that, um, that used a distribution that you haven't been exposed to, like Pareto, I would have given you that that uh, that PDF. So there's only one problem left on this handout, and it's it is different, but I'll I'll try to present it the same way as I did all the others. But you um, you actually could just use Bayes probability in order to answer this question. But I'll do it from a more 
um, parameter estimation type approach. And so in this one, it says, suppose that an observation will be selected from a Poisson distribution with a mean of two or four. We're, we're not sure which one it is. Prior to performing the experiment, it is known that the probability that lambda is two is 0.8, and the probability that it's four is 0.2. After performing the experiment, a value of x being six is observed. Which value is most likely correct? So essentially the question is, which is likely the better lambda value to use, two or four? That's our goal. And so one way to answer this would be, we want to know the probability that lambda is two given that we observe a data value of six. And we want to compare that to the probability that lambda is four given that the observed value is six. <clears throat> so I am going to recognize that this is proportional to the probability that x is six given lambda is two times the probability that lambda is two and likewise, the bottom probability is the probability that x is 6, given that lambda is 4, times the probability that lambda is 4. <clears throat> so this is working from the relationship that I have on top here, right, which is why I'm using a proportionality symbol. I dropped the probability that x equals six because there's no lambda value in that, which is why I'm using proportionality symbols instead of equal signs. And now I need to find all of these probabilities. The probability that lambda is two and lambda is four, those are given. So I know that this is 0.8 and this one was given to be 0.2. What's left is to find the conditional probabilities, which correspond to the likelihood, except this is a likelihood of just a single observation, so there's no product going on. X, we only have an X of six. If we had an X of six and an X of three and an X of 10, then you would multiply all those together, but, but that's not the scenario we're faced with here. So we want the probability that X is six given a particular lambda value. Now what's useful is we know that the data follow a Poisson distribution. So, and we know Poisson has a parameter of lambda. So conditioning on lambda being two for that first probability, I'm gonna calculate this as e to the negative lambda value of two, lambda of which is two to the x, which is six, over x factorial, which is six factorial. That is the conditional probability on top. And when you multiply that value by 0.8, you get point zero zero nine six. And if you do similarly for the probability x equals six, given that lambda is actually four, so this is e to negative lambda, which is four, four to the sixth power over six factorial, and you multiply that by two, you will get Point oh two oh eight. 
Now remember, we know that the probabilities are proportional to these answers, so those aren't actually the probabilities. But the proportionality constant that's missing is going to be the same for each probability. So if it were actually eight times that on top, it's still going to be eight times that on bottom. It's the same constant that's missing essentially. But what we can tell is that this is going to be the greater probability, which means that having a lambda value of four is more likely the correct value. So I will write that. Since this is larger, lambda equals four is most likely the correct value. And keep in mind, this is correct value between these two. So if you really wanted to find the best value, then you might try three or 6.2 or, you know, because lambda, lambda doesn't have to be an integer. It's useful if it is, but it doesn't have to be. So um, you could actually simulate a, a, a vector of values and try to figure out, okay, but where do we get an optimal probability? And, and that is going to be your best one. But in this case, we're just faced with two choices, either lambda is two or lambda is four. Wait, why is it more likely if it, or is it larger, like, is that like a larger probability? 0 0.02 is larger than 0 0.01. 2% is larger than... Oh, yeah. So. So larger probability, yeah. Mm -hmm. Means more likely, more probable. Anyone else? Again, you could you could either call out or post to the chat board. I'm not seeing anything, but we've gone through all of the examples. Okay, and Kiko posted a link to Wolfram Alpha. Um, that I guess you could use in order to search for an optimal length value if, if that was the task at hand. Right, Kiko, that's your point? I think so, yeah. Right. You can do derivatives to see where the maximum would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you could do that manually. You could just plug in lambda and try to search um, You know, I haven't actually investigated to see how easy it is, but you could just have, uh, let's see, you know, e to negative lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial. This is just some constant, so that's shifting it up and down. So it's really this part that you're going to want to take a derivative of and optimize. And there is some probability associated with it, so that's the only aspect that we're, we're missing. We don't know the probability that lambda is 3.4 or 7.2. But if you wanted to optimize this, which I just called Q, Q prime, you'd have negative e to the negative lambda, lambda to the x <coughs> plus x e to the negative lambda, lambda to the x minus 1. You set that equal to zero, and then you solve for lambda. The e to the negative lambda is, um, is in the same throughout, and so you could factor out an e to the negative lambda, and you could even factor out a lambda to the x, and what we're left with is a minus one in the first term plus x lambda to the negative one and this is only going to be zero when any of those terms is zero. You don't need all three, but e to the negative lambda will never be zero. It's only in zero as a limit, and so, so that's fine. And then lambda to the x, 
won't be zero because lambda has to be positive. And so no matter what, what value x is, that won't be zero. So you're really just looking for when negative one plus x over lambda is zero. And that will be when lambda is x. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, okay. It would still have the uh, given value for lambda. It would still hinge on that, I suppose, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, okay. for, for the probability, case, I mean, yeah. And so for our case, um, it looks like lambda should be six for this problem if, if that were the task at hand. Again, the problem isn't asking what value should lambda be, it's asking which of these two is better. But if it were, it looks like um, six is actually the best value. <laughs> Just because what was observed was x equals six. Keep in mind that we did not make use of the prior probability. Yeah, we, that's, that's kind of what I was uh, wondering. Yeah, the probability any granted so, lambda would still determine what you choose, I suppose. Yeah, so if, okay. um, if we had a function for that, then yeah. you would have multiplied that through. We don't, we don't have a function. We were just given explicit values. And so all of this would have been done with that probability of lambda in there. So Q would have been e to the negative lambda, lambda to the x times whatever the prior distribution is. And then you'd mm -hmm. be the derivative of that. So. Good, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So what, that is, is Q for? maximum likelihood estimation, by the way, in case you didn't see the, uh, the relationship. You know, there's a parameter. The likelihood based on a single x value is already the PDF. We took the derivative, um, set equal to zero, and solved. And so what we essentially found was the MLE. Um, so, wait, what was, I'm oh, sorry. No, I was just asking what you were asking. Uh, yeah, like, I, I'm not too sure like what you were doing like on the side there. I know you were just explaining it, but. Like, That's extra. If you don't get it, it's fine. I was just um, showing that if you wanted to try to find the best lambda value, whether it's two or four, but any value for lambda, then you would um, you would just simply use the posterior distribution and you would take the derivative, set equal to zero, and solve for that parameter. So that's all I was doing on the right. But we don't have a function for the, po the prior distribution. So that's the only thing that I, I ignored. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so that is it for estimation, for the uh, parameter estimation and the estimation chapter. Uh, for the most part, there's one more topic um, that I squeezed into the estimation, estimation section, and that is regression analysis, which I could start, I doubt we'll finish it, but, um, but we could always finish that one on Monday. So let's get to that one. And I did uh, post it shortly, you know, as class was starting. So you may not have seen it, but it should be visible. Winnie, did you happen to uh, to check and, and spot it there on Lulina? That was actually me. Um, yeah, I, I found it. Me, oh, Miku? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Miku. Yeah, so, so I did post the, um, this handout. I am simplifying things. I'm only gonna teach you the parametric side, so. As you can see, I crossed off the non-parametric side. Um, if you're wondering what it is, I'll just tell you that everything I've taught you so far is parametric. Parametric assumes an underlying normal distribution. So all the confidence intervals that you learned, those are parametric intervals because the underlying assumption is that your data are relatively normal, bell-shaped symmetric. Even if you're using the t-distribution, which is bell-shaped and symmetric, that is the underlying assumption. Non-parametric 
is when you don't have that assumption, whether you're not making it or it's wrong. So your data may be very skewed or uniform, which means that non, um, a normal distribution would be inappropriate. So that's just a little background for you if you were wondering what parametric and non-parametric meant, that's what they mean. I'm not teaching the non-parametric side. So I crossed off those halves of these tables and I also am going to, or already did, I crossed off B for problem one, B for problem two, and B for problem three. So I crossed off all the second parts because all those are non-parametric oriented. All right, so that's just a little bit um, clarifying because that you won't see these adjustments on what I posted, but I did that for my demonstration here. All right, so what is regression? Well, regression has a few names. You might come across it as simple linear regression or SLR. or least squares regression. And, and at least for what I'm teaching you, these are all the, the same thing. So if you're asked to perform simple linear regression, least squares regression, find the regression model, that, that is asking for the same thing. And what that thing is, is you need to find a line of this form, y equals alpha plus beta xi. Now there is a little other part, the epsilon term, but typically that epsilon term is treated like zero because the model is formulated in such a way where the expected value of those epsilon terms is zero. The epsilon terms are the residuals, which is just the difference between what is observed, so these are the observed y values, and what's expected. And what's expected are your y hat, which is just simply given by alpha plus beta x. So notice here I'm not including the epsilon term. This y hat model, this line, it has an mx plus b form, that is what we are gonna be making use of. And so the challenge is when you have data, you need to figure out what the slope and intercept are. <coughs> In case, You've forgotten the slope is this beta term and the y-intercept is alpha and the formulas to find both are given right here so alpha is going to be the average of the y minus beta times the average of the x and beta is your slope the slope which obviously you need in your y-intercept is given by R, which is your correlation. You got a taste of finding that back in the continuous chapter, times the standard deviation of Y over the standard deviation of X. The order of those standard deviations matters. So it has to be the, X, the Y one on top, the X one on the bottom. It's a big, a big place where students might mess up is, is putting them in the opposite locations. So let's see how to actually apply this. I'm going to jump to problem two for a moment. In problem two, it says some students finish exams early and rest or turn it in. Others will check it or use the full amount of time to take the test. Have you ever wondered what grades these students get? Are the students that finish first and rest or turn it in the best in the class or are they simply giving up? 10 students were recently observed in an exam and their grade and the amount of time they spent on the test were recorded. The data are listed and summarized below. This was an actual study that I did. I think I had more than 10 students in the class, but I just, I just 
for simplicity, pulled uh, pulled a random sample of ten of them, and I was wondering, you know, do the the really good students they know their stuff, they finish quickly, and they're just like, oh, I got this, and they turn it in, or is it the really weak students that don't really know? They gave one attempt, one run through, and they're like, you know, it is what it is, and I'm done. You could think from the other perspective, you know, the ones that take really long are they the great students that go through and then they double, maybe even triple check themselves, or is it the weak students that are really struggling and they're using as much time as they can to try to squeeze out as many points as possible? And I, I don't know the answer. And so I was curious and I recorded the time as students turned the information in. And that's what's in the table here. So you have uh, minutes, how long each of these 10 students took on the exam and the grade that they got on that test. I also already computed the means and variances for you. That's why I'm starting with problem two, because in practice, normally you'd have to calculate the means and variances, but I, I already did that for you here at the bottom of this table. The first challenge is to figure out, well, what is X and what is Y? To do that, you need to think, well, what do you feel is predicted from what? So do you feel that you might be able to predict someone's grade based on the time that they took? Or does it make more sense to predict how long do they take on the test based on the grade that they got? Remember, this is the grade on that test. What do you think? Which do you feel is predicted from the other? Grade based on time, and I see an agreement. Good, Kiko and Miku, yeah. So hopefully some others felt that way. So the one that you feel is predicted from or dependent on the other is your Y variable. So I'm going to label that so that we don't get confused. Grade is Y, and I believe that is predicted from time, which is our X. <clears throat> which means that X bar is 49.9, Y bar is 84.6. I'm just getting these values from the bottom of the table. I'm just rewriting them with labels. S, Y squared. Why am I squaring it? To get your variance. Mm -hmm, because I know that we have variances. <laughs> That's what's given. It's called VAR. And SX squared is given to be 63.88. All right, so part A, we are challenged with determining the regression equation, assuming normal residuals, which means we want to use the Y equals alpha plus beta X version. And there is another follow-up to that, but first let's get the regression equation. <clears throat> All right, so our slope is given by R times SY over SX. So we need R. We don't have R yet. R is given by the sum of xy minus n x bar y bar all over n minus 1 s sub x s sub y. When you have a data set, not a probability model, when you have a data set, this is what you would use in order to get your correlation. We have most of this. What we don't have is the sum of x, y term. And so to start you off with that, you're doing it row by row. So 49 times 90, this is the 10th person, is 4,410. 45 times 88 is 3,960. 52 times 81, I'm getting 4,212. <clears throat> and then you're going through 
and you're getting that product for every row. So I want you to do that. I'm gonna pause and I'm gonna give you some time in order to get, fill in the rest of the seven values and then add those 10 values up. Okay, so go ahead and do that. You are getting the remaining products, adding up that, that column. All right, so I, I suspect not everyone has finished this calculation just yet, but as a check, you should get a sum of 41,790. So feel free to follow through, make sure you're able to get it. And then just to start filling in the remaining concepts here, n is 10, x bar is 49.9, y bar is 84.6, n minus one is 10 minus one or nine, sx is the square root of 63.88, and sy is the square root of 70.71. <clears throat> and so again, I'm gonna pause the video and I want you to go ahead and calculate this correlation value and the slope. So see if you could plug in to the blue line above with the correct values. Very good, so you should get negative 0 0.703. And it's important for you to know, because it's a, a good mental check, R has to be somewhere between or equal to plus and minus one. And so if you happen to calculate and you are not inside that interval, then something's wrong. <clears throat> so um, it's good to keep that aspect in mind. So having a value of negative 0 0.703 is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong or unusual about it. And then when you plug in here, you've got negative 0.703. And then you remember that you need standard deviations and y is grade. So the standard deviation of y is gonna be the square root of 70.71. Standard deviation of x is the square root of 63.88. And I could see those values are pretty similar. So we're probably not gonna to change too far from negative 0.7. And I get negative 0.74 about, which is what Kiko, Miku, and Tony essentially had reported. So I will keep it more exact like they said and do negative 0.7399. And so that is our slope. Now that we have the slope, we are ready to get our y-intercept, which some of you may, may have jumped ahead to getting, and that's fine. And so alpha is y-bar minus the slope times x-bar. And so y-bar is 84.6 minus negative 0.7399. Be careful with your signs x bar is 49.9 which should actually give you a fairly big value i'm getting 121.52 about Again, you've got a double negative, so make sure you account for that. Everyone okay with that calculation? Yes, all right, thank you. And finally, <clears throat> that means that our regression equation is y hat equals 121.52 minus 0.7399 times x. And so this is our regression model. 
now that we have this model, let me go back to part A, because there was a question that I didn't read, but it's there. What would you predict the student's grade to be if they finish a test in 50 minutes? And so here, we're actually using, using this equation backwards. Because remember, x is time. And so we are, sorry, this is not backwards. We want y hat equals 121.52 minus 0.7399. They took 50 minutes. So you are going to let x be 50. And you're going to calculate this. And you should get about 84.5. I don't usually see grades reported beyond the first decimal or two, but but yeah, Nico or Kiko, that would be fine being uh, being a bit more precise. And so this would be our expected grade. And so based on this data, we've got this model. And I would come back and say, okay, well, I anticipate that a student that takes 50, 50 minutes on average, because that's what this model represents is the average value or the expected value, I expect their grade to be about 84.5. So this has not really investigated how good this model is. We just came up with the model and um, the correlation says that it's, it's a moderate model, you know, negative 0.7 is, uh, isn't terribly strong, but it's not weak. It's, it's moderate in terms of quality. Uh, let's see, let me start you off with the next problem. We don't have time to finish it, but we could at least begin. And here it's, we are wondering, are taller people perceived to be more attractive? A study had people rate individuals on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 is the highest level of attractiveness. The ratings are listed in the table below, along with their attractiveness ratings, or sorry, the height is listed along with the attractiveness ratings. And so there was someone 69, I think these must be inches, 69 inches tall. And the attractiveness rating they were given was a seven. Someone was 66 inches tall and they were given a rating of five. Another 66 inch tall person was a rating at eight and so forth. So that's, that's essentially what this table corresponds to. We want to generate a model for predicting one's attractiveness rating based on their height. And so this statement essentially tells you which is y and which is x. Can someone tell me which is y? Let's say attractiveness. Yeah, so we want to predict what rating will they get based on how tall they are. And so attractiveness is y and height is going to be x and that's based on what the problem is asking for. It's for asking for a model that predicts y based on x, so predicts rating based on their height. And we're assuming normality of the residuals in order to do the particular type of model that, that I just did for problem two. So based on our experience with this one, we now know what we need is going to be n, x bar, y bar, both variances or standard deviations, whichever one you want to get, in order to be able to get the slope and intercept. <clears throat> so we should be able to get at least three of those pretty quickly. What is n? Six. I heard a vote for five and then six. Miko, I trust that's a correction. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> yeah, so. It's six, you're looking at pairs, not total numbers. So 12 would be wrong, no one said it, but, um, but some of you may have thought it. So it's six pairs. And so you just look at any one column that would make it easier and you've got seven, eight, six, five, eight, ten. 10. So there's six values in one column. 
And then we need X bar and Y bar, which should be pretty quick to get. So go ahead and calculate those averages. Wait, how do you determine what's X and what's Y? In this case, well, it's always Y you believe is predicted from X. And based on what A says, we want a model to predict attractiveness rating based on height. And so because of that pattern, we know that Y must be the rating and X must be the height. So Miko, you're, you're a little faster than me. I did confirm X bar to be 66.833, or 83 repeating. Let me quickly check, 15, 20, 30, 38, 44, and yes, yeah, 7.33 repeating is what I get for Y bar, so good. We got those and Kiko supports that. And <clears throat> we don't necessarily have time to get at them, but we also need the variances. So go ahead and get those. And let's see, I'll do the variance of Y. So variance of Y, I get to be 3.06 repeating. <clears throat> and I also know that for the correlation, we are going to need an XY column. And I'll just start you off with that one, just so you recall when you look at it later, 69 times seven, is 483 and there's four more products to get <clears throat> so what i would like because we are pretty much out of time is for you guys to try to finish off problem one and you're welcome to try to do problem three you, you learned everything you need for it but at least you've got a, most of the information you need in problem one in order to finish that and uh and again we will start there um as a quick check for Monday and then we'll tackle three and then we'll move on to the last topic which is hypothesis testing and I will post that um, very soon today or tomorrow on uh, on the Lima so you have that handout also and that's it then uh, then we're done for the course have a wonderful um, what is today today's Thursday have a wonderful weekend and I will see you on Monday You're welcome